If a ship is damaged, be it in peace or war, there are usually two options. Make the repairs yourself, or head home if the damage is too great for that. But around the turn of the 20th century, a third option began to percolate through various fleets. The repair ship, which slotted somewhere between the other two courses of action. They'd existed in the past, but now they became a regular feature of various fleets. USS Vestal was just such a ship in service to the US Navy. She'd be the fourth such ship to be commissioned into the US Navy, and apart from a few scattered examples that were named after stars, she would also be the last US repair ship to not have a name from Greek mythology, the Vestals of course being both Roman and not exactly mythical. Initially ordered as the Collier Erie in early 1904, the ship was renamed Vestal before her keel was laid down in early 1907, with the ship taking just over a year to launch and a year and a half to fit out, entering service as a fleet collier to the Atlantic fleet. This phase of her career was relatively brief, lasting almost exactly three years before the upcoming shift of new build ships to oil fuel and the launch or acquisition of other colliers made the 12,500 tonne vessel surplus to those requirements, whilst the US Navy needed her to fill another role. And so she went into the Boston Navy Yard and emerged a year later in a new guise, that of the fleet repair ship. Although fleet was in her name, her 16 knot top speed meant that she wasn't expected to sail with the fleet at battle speed, but she could keep up with most fleet deployments when the battleships were moving at their cruising speed. The most immediate visual difference was fewer and less complex onboard cranes compared to her former occupation, and she was once more assigned to the Atlantic Fleet, staying on the US East Coast and in the Caribbean until the US entry into World War I saw her deployed to Ireland to support the US destroyers that had been sent there to help fight the U-boats. She returned to the US East Coast with the conclusion of hostilities, leading a relatively quiet life until 1925 when, in common with many other older but still useful US Navy vessels in this period, she was brought in for conversion from coal to oil power. Almost immediately after which, she was called in to help the then-Captain Ernest J. King in his efforts to recover the USS S-51, a submarine which had been rammed and sunk by a merchantman. In this role, her size, heavy-duty cranes, and onboard repair shops proved quite useful in accommodating and maintaining the salvage crews, as well as raising and lowering various heavy objects to and from the wreck. With this done, she was transferred to the Pacific Fleet, which would be her first taste of these waters, in 1927. The rest of the interwar period passed fairly calmly, and on December 6, 1941, she was moored alongside USS Arizona to support the minor overhaul the ship was undergoing, which included a repainting effort, the extent of which has vexed historians ever since. It was expected that these duties would take about a week, but of course the Japanese Navy had other ideas as the next day the Kido Batai descended on Battleship Row. Possessed of a mere handful of small calibre guns, Vestal put up a brief resistance before she was hit by two bombs. She was of course not designed to take this kind of punishment, and keeping the ship afloat became the more pressing issue, especially after various nearby explosions had blown most of the anti-aircraft gunners into the water, followed by the colossal explosion of Arizona herself alongside, which sent anyone remaining in an exposed position out into the sea. Her captain, Cassin Young, realised if his ship stayed in place, then she was going to join the Arizona sooner rather than later, as oil from the battleship was both on fire and spreading. And so he swam back toward the Inferno, reboarded his ship, and ordered her to get underway. With the help of a tug, Vestal just about got free, albeit in a slowly sinking condition and rather unhelpfully on fire astern. Realising the inevitable, Cassin Young saved the ship by grounding her in a stable and shallow position, which allowed the crew to put out the fires and then start preparing salvage and repair teams to be sent over to the ships that were in considerably worse state. Being a repair ship, Vestal's crew also got their own ship repaired and refloated in order to save dry dock space for ships that were more in need. Once those had been seen to, Vestal was given a quick final overhaul and sent straight out to support ships on the front lines in summer 1942. From her various anchorages, she would help patch up numerous famous vessels as they returned from action, USS Saratoga, North Carolina, South Dakota, 
and Enterprise were all her customers, in some cases repeat customers. As the Guadalcanal campaign escalated, a laundry list of battered cruisers also began to show up, including several that were missing their bows, or had large bits of themselves hanging on by only a few bits of hull plating. By mid-1944, Vestal herself needed a quick overhaul, but with this done she was deployed to Ulithi and then beyond, where kamikaze damage began to outnumber the more conventional bomb and torpedo damage that had been her previous experience when patching up various ships. World War II concluded, with the ship still intact, having successfully attended to dozens of ships, either patching them up enough to be sent back to the front lines, or securing them sufficiently that they could survive the voyage home. This wasn't quite the end of her duties, though. A series of vicious typhoons in mid and late 1945, including the particularly vicious typhoon Louise in October, left her with much work to do through to the end of the year. By this stage more than a little worn out and due for replacement, her last duties upon her return home were, ironically enough, to support the shipyards that would eventually dismantle her in the decommissioning of other ships. With the initial surge of decommissionings post-war over, she was then taken out of service in August 1946, remaining in reserve for a little while before being sold for scrap in 1950. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.